did we go from BLM protests to skepticism of the hard sciences? And what do Shakespeare and Pulp Fiction have to do with it? What? I will explain all of this in the next few minutes. Graphic footage of police violence in the United States sparked large-scale protests all over the world against racism and discrimination. Anger had been brewing under the surface for years and is probably further amplified by the other big crisis that plagues the world today. Obviously we notice the echoes of colonial times and racism is still a thing, so it makes sense that anti-racist movements exist. But it also seems that the upheaval has created momentum for some more obscure ideologies spilling into Western society. An example of this, and you may have heard about it, was the Shutdown Academia and Shutdown STEM initiative, which was supported by arguably the most prestigious peer-reviewed science journal, Nature. Nature issued a statement in which they claimed that the lack of racial diversity among scientists is evidence of racism in science and needs to be dealt with. Okay, that's reasonable. However, according to Shutdown STEM and some activists, the problem at hand is more fundamental. Not just are certain groups underrepresented in science, the science itself perpetuates systemic and institutional racism according to the activists. And no, I'm not talking about actual scientific racism, but it is suggested that fundamental scientific ideas such as Newton's laws of gravity or even fundamental math are permeated with colonial totalitarian principles. These ideas have been lingering in academia for some time. However, in a few decades, they have gone from obscure theories to prominent in activist circles and now in the wake of the protests into the mainstream. For example, the Decolonizing Light project investigates the reproduction of colonialism through physics and the physics of light in particular. It contrasts principles from physics to indigenous ways of knowing or epistemologies. This might sound strange to some, but for those working inside of academia, especially in North America, this call for the decolonization of science has been going on for some time. Before we jump to conclusions, let's have an open mind about this. I do think it is interesting to place Western narratives into a different perspective or critique them. For example, Western medicine can be quite stubborn in its reliance on pharmaceuticals. Especially in recent years, we are discovering more alternative therapies and methods that in some cases actually yield comparable to superior results in well-designed clinical trials. Yet in other cases we have just assembled so much evidence for a scientific principle that there really is very little room for any alternative. It almost seems that activists misunderstand that many fundamental laws of physics such as Newton's laws are not constructs. They are descriptions of reproducible observations that always work, although within certain boundary conditions. And that last part is important because every scientist knows that theories are not absolute truths, but always have their limits. For example, you can, again, use Newton to describe a simple moving body of mass, for instance, a bullet. But it becomes inaccurate when the body approaches light speed, such as particles in a particle accelerator. This is where Einstein's special relativity is required to observe the observation accurately. That doesn't mean that you can dismiss Newton. It works perfectly if you satisfy the boundary conditions. Moreover, a lot of math and science was also observed in non-Western cultures, such as Babylon and Egypt. They found similar fundamental principles, which shows the universality of fundamental science. Many scientific designs may not provide the same certainty as fundamental laws, but for the layman it's hard to see the difference. This allows one to sell the idea that all of science is just another perspective. Those concerned with this topic have probably stumbled upon the schools of critical theory and postmodernism. 
I've noticed that the debate around this topic seems very politically polarized between the contemporary left and right, with very little people actually engaging with the ideas in a balanced way. The truth is usually not so black and white, so instead I would like to actually dive into the theories a bit to show where I think some of these thinkers may have some good points, so that we can also better understand where these critiques on the hard sciences are coming from. Doing so then allows us to see where I think some of the theories go wrong and why. I should also make the disclaimer that critical theory and especially postmodernism are very broad and fractured schools of thought concerned with much more than what is discussed here. In 1979, the philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard published a book called The Postmodern Condition. This book introduced the term postmodernism to philosophy, which before that was mostly used to describe the postmodern art movement. Lyotard stated that although postmodernism is a fractured school of thought, one of the central themes was a skepticism of so-called meta-narratives. A meta-narrative or grand narrative is explained as a typical enlightenment phenomenon in which elements of history, science and logic are combined into theories that sort of tell the great stories of how our societies work. Examples of grand narratives are Marxism, which provides dogmatic ideas of a capitalist society progressing into communism, or the theory of evolution Darwinism. The theories themselves are typically based on objective observations, however, a meta-narrative might be used to dictate the course of society into the future. And this, according to Lyotard and many others, is a problem. He proposed a more plural and subjective approach of small narratives to approach the postmodern world. Critical theorists expressed a very similar skepticism about grand narratives around the 60s and the 70s. Their theories are actually founded on updated versions of Marxism. Their ideas were very important in shaping the countercultures of the 60s. The critical theorist Marcuse, Marcuse. in his famous work One Dimensional Man, argues that even though the Enlightenment schools proposed a society based on rationality, the advanced Western societies had not become rational at all. In fact, according to Marcuse, the idea of rationality and reason had turned into dogmas, eternal truths not to be questioned. These kinds of critiques made us take a second look on how we viewed things like sexual orientation or gender roles which had indeed been quite dogmatic and totalitarian up till the 60s. Another obvious example of grand narratives that turned out very bad and dogmatic is social Darwinism or eugenics, which had served as a prelude to the advance of World War II. I think it is from this perspective that we can appreciate some of the skepticism for grand narratives. But Lyotard didn't stop there. He continues to also question fundamental science as grand narratives and claims that the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics shows the underlying subjective postmodern nature of reality. Without getting into the complex world of quantum mechanics, I think this statement is quite a stretch. Lyotard later claimed he actually did not have enough knowledge about the sciences he was writing about. He considered the postmodern condition simply the worst of all his books. However, this didn't stop skepticism towards the hard sciences, as I showed at the beginning of this presentation. And although we've seen examples where critical theory might have a point, you cannot help but think they're going way too far. To understand this, we should ask how they arrive at such ideas in the first place. This is usually done with strands of theory, such as post-structuralism, which is very central to postmodernism. These theories are quite abstract, so I will take a bit of a leap from structuralism to post-structuralism, but I think it will explain the basic ideas. I will also give some more practical examples, so just hold on. Most of the 20th century theories known as semiotics maintain something like objects ranging from human text to human culture can be 
understood in forms of an underlying structure modeled on systems such as language. And that, for example, the unconscious, like the psychologist Lacan argues, is ordered like a language as well, which in turn can be used to show that many of the things that we take for granted are constructs as well, such as culture, our nationality, and the stories on which those are based. However, post-structuralists argue that if you want to understand these constructs, you also have to look at the culture and history that produced the constructs in the first place. So the meaning is subjective, it depends on who you ask. This then also allows you to deconstruct virtually any meaning you take for granted. In practice, the post-structuralists might look at a piece of text from Western literature and try to derive the underlying cultural constructs by reading between the lines and trying to derive the so-called intertext. It is presumed that you can only understand the text or film for that matter if you already are familiar with certain other cultural concepts. For example, to play a video game or not to play a video game, that is the question. You immediately see the reference to Shakespeare putting such an everyday question in juxtaposition to Hamlet contemplating suicide. It's probably meant to ridicule it in some way. But you can only understand it if you get the reference. So the meaning goes beyond what the text literally says. And someone with a different cultural background might actually derive a different meaning from the text. The movie Pulp Fiction, considered a postmodern film, is basically based on this model. It's full of references. Similarly, your favorite hipster coffee joint is also full of funny one-liners from 90s B-movies. Again, you can only understand it if you have the cultural reference. Thanks to information technology, we are bombarded with all kinds of symbols that refer to other things all the time. So it's easy to argue that we live in a very postmodern world in which meaning is increasingly hard to establish. Does she know she's an ad? But here's the problem. You might be able to argue that social Darwinism is a narrative partly produced by society. But for fundamental science that's highly reproducible and consistently makes technology function, this makes little sense. It's not a matter of perspective whether modern technology functions, it consistently does so. That doesn't mean that you cannot look at other perspectives, but it also doesn't mean that you can dismiss the established understanding as simply colonial. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true because of simple counting. Sure, the symbol for 2 could be something else, but that's just semiotics. The mechanism of counting still works. The color of your skin is really not a factor here. Nevertheless, postmodern methods seem to be able to produce almost any conclusion within the current academic climate. It has been twice now that scientists were able to publish bogus science using postmodern methodologies, the Sokol affair and the grievance studies affair. One can now see how you could arrive at seeing Newton's laws as some kind of colonial construct with a bit of language gymnastics. I guess this was a lot of information, so let's see if we can summarize and conclude. We have seen that the current upheaval has created momentum for a science skepticism. I have showed how these ideas evolved out of theories developed in the 60s, aimed at critiquing grand narratives, providing some legitimate criticism of, for example, social Darwinism. We have also seen that these theories bring some interesting new perspective for literature and movies. But in its critique of the hard sciences, the theories overstep their boundaries in the present day. Critical theory and various schools of postmodernism started out as an opposition against unchallenged grand narratives. It seems to me that some parts of these theories are today becoming grand narratives themselves. In some cases even shutting people down who think differently. Whatever your opinion, I think we should try to maintain our tradition of open discourse. Since you made it this far, I'd like to thank you for watching. If you like the content, please leave a like and make sure to correct me in the comments if you think I made a mistake somewhere. Thanks again.